right, welcome to VMware Explore Barcelona day two coverage, virtually speaking. Man, we've been having some great conversations. John, when you come to Europe, it's different than coming to Vegas. Uh, there are certainly different concerns, uh, a lot of things around data sovereignty around here. Yeah, well, one thing that always just impresses me is how many languages I hear in the hallway. And I'm like, okay, that's some Spanish, I can understand that. Uh, that's Portuguese, I can recognize it's Portuguese. <laughs> um, you know, but some of the, the the amount of conversations, and it's it's great because you know I, I I guess they get some privacy because I can't definitely understand German oh, at a, all. But it's a form uh, of security, right? It, yeah, it's a form of security that they you know I only I, I only know English and Spanish. Okay, I talk so. about you all the time in Spanish, and you never understand. Uh, it's, <laughs> Well, John, I, I'm excited. Like one of the great things about coming to Barcelona, obviously, is reconnecting with some of our, our partners and our, yeah. our customers that are, you know, from VMware by Broadcom. Uh, and one of them is here, a good friend of the show, Guy Bartram. Welcome back to Virtually Speaking. Thanks, having me on. Yeah. So, Guy, uh, I know you've got a session this week unlocking the power of VCSP, delivered uh, delivered sovereign cloud. That's a that's a tongue twister for me. Yeah. Why don't we start with the, just the high level? What is the VSCP for folks that are not uh, familiar with that? All right, so our VMware Cloud Service Providers, love the branding, it's always really complicated. VCSP, VCSP. the artist formerly known as VCPP, VC formerly yeah. known as VCAN, I think. <laughs> yeah, I that's right, yeah, you got it. He's there, got there's the been history. a few incarnations of it. Um, all right. Well, we're finally there. So over the last, what, nine months, we've taken the old VM VMware VCPP program we had around 4,500 partners in there. It was an awfully big long tail of partners who weren't doing very much. And now we have um, about 2,800 partners. Um, they're on the Broadcom Advantage program. They are either pinnacle level, premier level, or registered partners. And they're all transacting on VCF now. So that's the, the big news is we have a lot of partners. And I think you mentioned something earlier is quite funny about the, the languages, right? Europe is a complicated estate. Uh, I always look at the American cloud service provider market and I think it's, it's quite easy to understand. There's a small amount of big players. I mean, I can't understand Louisianans, but you know, that's, <laughs> that's a different deal. But yeah, it's... It, it's very complicated over here. And when you think about like, we used to have um, our, what we call our aggregator partners. We had like five globally. Um, those five were in the US. Then we had about 43 in EMEA to take care of all the local linguistic um, and you know differences in personalities that you get in, in, in the EU. So it's, it's a big complicated market, but the good news is we've built the program. Our cloud service provider is now delivering VCF. The VCF's cloud. a big deal, because there were, there were cloud providers who'd bought into the full you know vision, they had network virtualization, they had portability, they had all the capabilities. Yeah. And then you had people that are like, okay, we're just running vSphere and we're, we're barely one step ahead above the last supported patch level. And so, you know, having some life cycle changes, it sounds like that's that's changing a bit. Yeah, I mean, getting our cloud providers to adopt VCF, um, you know, a lot of them had most of the components live in production in any case. They had, you know, Aria operations, they had Network Insight, they had uh, Cloud Director, vSphere, you know, you name it, NSX was a big one, security. Um, so they're already familiar with a lot of components, but they didn't have it packaged and offered out as a private dedicated cloud or a, a managed private cloud or a managed public cloud. So we've gone to town on those three cloud models of our cloud providers. And the VCF architecture really supports that. Um, they've got all the skills and resources already in those products. So it's been, for some, it's been quite difficult naturally, but for most, it's been a pretty okay transition. Well, it, it should help them because if they have lifecycle capability Particularly if you're having to disaggregate across multiple countries, you have to have point of presence in all these different countries. Yeah. You have to life cycle all those areas or, or stitch them together with networking and uh, yeah. having that capability hopefully should help. Oh, dude, you, you're talking about a huge environment. It is the fourth mega cloud. We're talking thousands and hundreds of thousands of hosts, probably millions of VMs running in that state. You know, bigger than one and a hyperscalers. It, it is the fourth mega cloud you've never heard of. Wow. That's the, the catch line that we like. <laughs> I like it, I like it. So, Guy, maybe we can talk a little bit about the importance of uh, sovereign, sovereign data management. I know that's something that you've been talking about a lot recently. Yeah, I mean, sovereignty, firstly, what is it? What does it mean? Secondly, why, does it, why do you care? Why does everyone care about it? Um, so what does it mean? It, it basically, what it, what it boils down to is you have different areas which you want to focus on. Data is one, right? 
your data is yours. You're responsible for your data wherever it's running, whatever cloud. Operations is another. Who's going to be actually touching your systems? Yeah. Who can get access to your data? Are they security cleared? Are they vetted? Do you know they're accessing your data? Uh, and then accounting and management and metadata, data produced by data, data used for accounting. You know, this can contain sensitive information like IP addresses, host names, access um, passwords potentially. Um, and what we've seen in the American hyperscaler partners is these guys have a huge presence in Europe. They have around 90% of the EU data running in them. So it's a significant challenge for Europeans to understand where their data is because as the American here, I'm laughing. I have all your data, apparently. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, <laughs> laughs at American. Hyperscalers right. replicate their data across the world. Yeah, right? sure, sure. They, you know, if your data hasn't been used for a long time, it will get automatically replicated somewhere else. If there's a uh, issue in a data center and there's a fallout, a, a failover, that could be to another region, could be outside of your jurisdiction, outside of your country. Um, so this is kind of why you should care, right? We have Cloud Act. Everyone knows about a Cloud Act, right? It's a US company, doesn't matter if it's based in Brazil or um, Thailand. They can exfiltrate your data. They can exfiltrate your data. Uh, very FISA data, 702, yeah. they can access your, their, your data whenever they like and they don't even have to tell you yeah, about it. Yeah, secret courts, you don't, your lawyers don't get an opportunity to block it. Yeah. yeah, and I think there's been a, obviously there's been a rise in geopolitical tensions, particularly in the EU, um, and this is causing concern about actually being able to manage your data and your data being your economy, which is basically yep. what it is, right? You want to invest in your economy. Absolutely. You want to have your data under your control. So look at it as you got data, you got operations, you got accounting, but re and it's not just about data residency. That's a common mistake. And when you hear cloud service providers like the hyperscalers talking about sovereignty, they're really talking about residency, most of them. It's about jurisdictional control. Do you have legal ownership of your data and is it not subject to external jurisdiction? Yeah, is there the an thing. opaque process where someone can quietly make that data leave on the back end? You know, exactly. that MPLS network's connected out. <laughs> yeah, or would a tunnel flip to another, another zone, yeah. Yeah, it seems like VMware Cloud Foundation is a great fit for, for, for this problem that we're even talking about, you know, especially with all this repatriation. It just makes, it makes, it probably makes your job a lot easier. Yeah, I mean, you know, previously we had a huge portfolio <laughs> and uh, we were coming up with architectures, reference architectures to support all this stuff. Um, now, the reference architecture is what the reference architecture is. There's no deviation from it, really. Yeah. Um, the major change our providers had to do is really focus on consolidations cause, because we were moving from memory-based utilization metrics to cores. So they had to consolidate their architecture to optimize their cost for VCF. Um, but now, really, the case is about, okay, so what vertical are you playing in? What's your skills? How do you need to overlay compliance and auditing on that VCF for your healthcare customer, your finance customer? So the pitch has changed from us like, focusing on delivering the infrastructure to working with the partners on you know, your particular customer vertical or your, your industries that you're supporting. Yeah, absolutely. I, I like that change in that it's it's no longer competing just on the base capabilities because we can deliver all of them to an air gap full of full sovereign control. But um, yeah, they can help have more value add up the stack to the application layer. We're, we're used to supporting healthcare customers or we, we know, we're really good at running SAP or whatever that application suite is. Yeah. They can differentiate. Exactly. I heard a term uh, when I was looking into this that, that I had not heard before. It was sovereign AI. Yeah. yeah, I know that's a new use case, but maybe we can talk a little bit about what that is. Okay, so, um, well, we obviously have private AI. Yeah. Um, now, sovereign AI is, I, w I would say when we, when we talk about, when Broadcom talks about AI, we're talking about private AI. Um, when the market is talking about sovereign AI, that is a sovereign cloud running AI within it. It could be our AI, it could be homegrown, it could be anything else. The, the difference is, you know, when you look at AI, you've got to look at certain things around data classification. You've also got to be mindful of things like the AI Act, which is all about kind of the risk uh, and the industry that you're fo focusing in. If it's a high risk area, you need to have more um, focus on making it 
some Sorry. of the most interesting data sets for doing AI is like, okay, we want to we mine all of the financial transactions of all these people and the metadata associated with that is terrifying because you could, I know exactly where Pete had breakfast and you know, <laughs> and how long it took him before he called the Uber to leave there and like you, <laughs> you look at that or, or healthcare data, yep. you know, which the breaches on that are terrifying. But on the other hand, the, the opportunity to mine this data and do more effective things for for you know national security and, and nation states, but also like uh, healthcare research, we talked to uh, the NHS and they're like, look, we're changing the laws so we can sit here and mine all the data and try to optimize health outcomes. And there's great opportunity, but also when you make that giant pile of you know valuable data, you've you've got to make sure it it doesn't leave and it doesn't go to bad actors. Well, I think this is what the AI Act is trying to focus on. One is it uh, you know uh, critical national infrastructure. Yeah. Um, two, it's um, responsibility and responsible AI. So it's understanding how the data is going to be used, who even the users are, have they been trained in you know, things like GDPR, do they understand things about privacy? And then it's of course how you build the AI, what are you going to train it on, the type right. of data? Are you going to use a pre-built model? Well, that's open source. You know, there's there's threats already in those open source oh, models. Oh, yeah, you're pulling that in. We're just checking yeah. that in. And it, it, you've got Hopefully to be... some ethics. We don't accidentally build Skynet, so. <laughs> yeah, I mean, responsible AI is a big thing. So when, when like, countries are looking at delivering national agendas like the NHS in the UK, yeah. um, you know, there needs to be a level of sovereignty and uh, security applied to the data sets that they're using and how that data then gets used. And I think the AI acts that regulation will always follow on behind like a, the golden retriever to the man walking out in the woods who's striding ahead and innovating. Well, they never regulate prior to something. It's always post. So sure. they've got a tough job to try and do that. And, and I honestly feel like a lot of the AI, it's in a heavy overlap with data science. And, and it feels almost like an HPC workload, even though it's, it's, I know it's kind of an adjacent market. But historically, that was an area that wasn't focused on deep, rich controls. It's like, okay, we have these giant pharma blades that grind at this workload, and we're just trying to be as fast as possible. And when we start talking about security controls and, and compliance and that, that's that sounds like boring enterprise things. Like, that's a different data set. That's the boring data. And it, it looks like we're trying to get the enterprise rich capabilities of compliance and governance and do that, but also do it on very expensive, massive data center sets and data center size and have that move fast, but also not break things, like try to bring this together. Yeah, and there's no reason why you can't do both. Um, obviously, striding ahead is a lot of fun without taking into account any of the sensible things you need to think about in life. But the reality is you're going to be exposing data. You will be subject to fines and they're fairly serious. You know, we're still seeing breaches in GDPR, for, in for instance, LinkedIn, a couple of weeks ago, $350 million, maybe a small amount to them. That's 15 minutes of Microsoft's revenue, but yeah. Yeah, but you know, it's still happening, right? Yes, it is, yes it <laughs> and is. And it shouldn't be happening at this stage, but no. you know, if we can't get data privacy right at its basics, how are we gonna get data privacy right when a system is autonomously doing it for us? That's a fair point. It's a, it's a scary thing to consider, actually. Yeah. <laughs> I'm gonna go to, I, I need to go delete some social media. I'll be right back. <laughs> yeah. Well, we certainly don't have the answer to that one on this episode, but Guy, I'm so thankful for you joining us today. Uh, for those that are at VMware Explore, be sure to check out his session, Unlocking the Power of VCSP, Delivered Sovereign Cloud. Guy, thanks for joining us on Virtually Speaking. Welcome, thanks for having me.